I read an article this past week from Presbyterian Outlook, and it was pushing back on the idea that modern day America isn't religious anymore. They use the example of how many cities in America relate to the NFL, particularly their city's team. And if we look at this, we see extreme devotion and loyalty to a team. Now you guys all know me, I'm a diehard Eagles fan, so I'm, you know, reading it all in. But if, if you, you look at the NFL and your team, we see rituals like we have in worship. We see there's tailgating, there's chants. Sophie already knows the Eagles chant really well. Uh, you sing anthems at the beginning. You even have a certain attire that you wear. And we see people ordering their days around these games, setting this time apart as if it's sacred. Uh, yesterday we were at a Penn State game. John is a Penn State family, so don't even get me started on college football and their religiosity in that. It's a different level. But you see people make meaning out of what it meant in their life to be an Eagles fan or a Patriots fan or a Green Bay fan. You see the way it's a part of one's identity. It gives people hope. Modern day Americans are still religious and worshipful. Maybe they have just shifted their religiosity to something other than the traditional liturgical church. The article I read was not pessimistic. In fact, it was almost optimistic. Worship and religiosity is part of who we are as a people. It's ingrained in us. The desire is not gone, just misplaced. There is no judgment in this article. The author values the way being a Green Bay Packers fan has been a part of his life. And it's just an observation. In the New Testament, people who convert to worship, Jesus, are not expected to wipe clean their entire culture and their whole identity, they are encouraged to see how the two fit. <clears throat> Note, I bring this up on a week where we have a bye, um, and since we are doing so terrible, it feels like at this moment in time I could very well give up my idolatrous worship of the Eagles altogether, <laughs> although ask me again in two weeks. But I bring this up this week because our scripture talks about idols, worshiping idols, idols being something other than God, the God of Jesus Christ. So let's take a good look at what does that actually look like and what does that mean for us in modern day America? I find this text fascinating. Moses reasons with God. A human reasons with God. Moses actually questions God, insinuating that God is about to be a hypocrite and basically says, get it together, man. And God does. God listens to a human. So what does this tell us about God? I think it tells us a lot about God. I think it tells us God is not that proud. Not like we have come to think of God as. Who do you know lets their child call them out and then listens to what their child says? Sometimes I do, but she's kind of a bully. <laughs> Moses didn't get in trouble for talking back. Most of us would get in trouble for talking back. God listens. He allows Moses to express himself because he believed what Moses had to say was worth listening to. God takes feedback. This may be uncomfortable, but God does take feedback. How wonderful, don't we wish our bosses would do this? Not mine, mine's good. But I'm sure lots of people would wish that their <laughs> boss would take feedback. And we serve a God who takes feedback. It also tells me that God gets emotional, maybe even has an overreaction. For those of you who have ever had overreactions to things, maybe you hear yourself in this story, how quickly you got fired up, you seem to take a deep breath and calm down. I just kept thinking when I was reading this, Moses is like, hey God, you want to chew it over with a Kit Kat? And then God was fine. And it also tells me that God respects us. Not as God's minions, but as humans who God wants to have mutual respect with. This encounter between God and Moses shows us this is not a one-sided relationship. 
God compromises, God relents, God allows others to help him make the best decision sometimes. And that makes make some of us uncomfortable. Deciding not to take people's life out of anger, I think was the right decision. And would God have made that decision if not for Moses speaking up? Maybe, maybe not. The scripture doesn't tell us that. But the scripture does make sure to show us this conversation. <clears throat> So what does that mean for us speaking up? What is our role in each other's lives? It's so easy to say it's not our place. And sometimes it's not. People have a lot of opinions that don't do anyone any good by being shared. But sometimes it is our place to help people make good decisions, to educate people, or to share experiences or challenge people. You know, this text tells us about the character of God, but it also tells us about our relationships in general. We can talk about God and who God is all day long, but if it doesn't inform or change the way we go about our lives, what are we doing it for? I think to worship God means to take God's teachings and integrate them. I would even go so far as to say, just learning about God day after day in Bible study, thinking we are being good Christians, and yet not actually doing anything with it, could be a form of idolatry. At that point, we are worshiping not God, but knowledge of God. And we are doing it because it's easier or more convenient than what it means to actually worship God. Many Christians are obsessed with God, but it is interesting to me because I'm trying to figure out why or what for. I know it's in the name of worship, but sometimes it doesn't feel quite right. To want to learn everything about the Bible, the history and context and culture, to become almost an expert, to listen to Christian music and watch Christian shows and listen to Christian podcasts and spend time with other Christian people and read Christian books. There's nothing wrong with any of these things, but at some point, it begins to feel more like a hobby, something that has fascinated you, like a Star Wars fan fiction or something like that. I'm not a Star Wars person, but it's kind of what it reminds me of. It's almost like God is some celebrity you're obsessed with, the way people are obsessed with Taylor Swift. But is that really worship? What does it actually mean to worship God? I propose what it means to worship God is to live your life as best you can in accordance with the teachings we see in the Bible. And friends, what I'm going to say here might feel odd, but hear me out. I think we take our obsession with God too far. To learn the teachings of the Bible is not that time consuming. It is good to understand context and culture and history. Yes, to some extent. But I believe the Bible is written for anyone to be able to glean what is needed. So to think we need a college level class on it, to me, is for our own interest and not for worshipful reasons. Is it good for us to be reminded of the teachings? Of course. But for many of us who have grown up in the church, the stories are embedded embed in within us. I think the learning how to be a good Christian is the easy part. Doing it is the hard part. What if all the hours we spent on Bible study and being good Christians were instead spent on reconciling relationships, meeting the needs of the community, working towards ending injustice? That's what it looks like to worship God. I just don't know if God is that impressed that I opened my Bible for the hundredth time if I haven't done any of the things that it says. Reading scripture to feel good about ourselves and convince ourselves God feels, convince ourselves God feels good about us feels idolatrous. And to go a step deeper on what I think it really looks like to worship God is to work on how we respect and dignify other people. I'm not talking about the treat others how you want to be treated, love others, and love God. We often talk about this as doing good deeds and being nice, and yes, even being respectful. But I'm talking about real respect and real dignity. There was nothing nice that transpired between Moses and God, and yet it was real, and justice was accomplished, and relationships deepened, 
and the world took one more step toward goodness. So again, I ask, what does this passage tell us about how to be in relationship with each other? How to be in relationship with God? The way we are in relationship with each other is the way we are in relationship with God, because God is in each and every one of us. I'm going to give an example of how I think this plays out, how giving others respect and dignity is what it means to worship God. Uh, So a little background info, full transparency. My parents are in Denver visiting my brother and his wife, hopefully not live streaming because of the time difference, so hopefully they will never know what I'm about to say. (laughs) But growing up, I didn't always respect my parents. I was not one of those kids who thought my parents knew what they were talking about or had answers or wisdom. I thought I knew way more than them, and I didn't feel any desire to listen to them other than because they held my freedom in their hands. But if you fast forward to my college years and me maturing and looking back at my relationship with my parents, I realized how the respect and dignity my parents showed me as a person and not as their daughter created a confidence, independence, and self-worth that enables me to give the same to others. So what do I mean by this? My parents, even when we were teenagers, treated us like people who had worthy opinions and outlooks. They treated us like we could teach them something, just like they could teach us something. They valued us, my siblings and I, and raised us to be our own people, not influenced by their desires and needs. They allowed us to challenge them, speak our minds, and even push back. Were they in charge? Yes. But they could still fully respect us as individual people they were in relationship with. My brother, sister, and I can fully be ourselves and disagree without fear of our parents thinking about us differently or judging us. We can feel comfortable telling my dad that he raised three feminists, and if he wants to really know and understand us, well, he better open up his mind. And he did. My parents allowed themselves to be changed for the better by their children because they treated us with respect and dignity. And this also allowed us as their children to operate as respected and dignified people in this world. A good and healthy relationship, in my opinion, is one of the most powerful and faithful things you can do in this world. This is what I see in this interaction between God and Moses. I see a healthy relationship in which both people were needed to make a beautiful thing happen. I see God using God's relationship with us to make us know and understand that we are worthy of respect and dignity because God gives us that. I see the truth that relationships take humbleness and courage and require an open mind. And God showed us that example. If God can do that, then we can do that. And I see that God listens. God listens because what you think and feel matters. God listens because it is respectful. God listens because God is in relationship with us. God is not a hobby or a celebrity to be obsessed with. God wants to help you do this life well. So don't fall into the idolizing trap of worshiping God by knowing trivia about God. Actually worship God by spending your time and energy being with God in the world. The people who crafted the golden calf were so obsessed with the idea of worship. It wasn't a bad thing. They thought this was what they were supposed to be doing. But they were so obsessed with the idea of worship that they worshiped something else. Whereas Moses is on the mountain yelling at God, And that was the most beautiful act of worship we see because it's in its real relationship taking place. So don't be so focused on worship that you worship the wrong things. Be so focused on the teachings of God that living your daily life is the most beautiful act of worship you can do. Amen.